I want to speak to you today from the topic, the discomfort of a holy calling, the discomfort of a holy calling. Yesterday, I spoke about the importance of knowing exactly what you believe about God, uh, simply because we have to understand uh, how our theology is grounded and how it impacts our understanding of what I think is the foundational understanding of God, that is love, and not only that, but the command to love not only God, but to love our neighbors as ourselves, and that higher calling that Jesus gives, the higher commandment to love one another as Jesus has loved us. And given the challenging times in which we live, I want to take a look at how we interpret this call that Jesus claims for himself and how we might see a way to understand our own callings uh, from God. If you've studied uh, liberation theology, Black liberation theology in particular, you may know the work of the Reverend Dr. James Cone, who passed away just a few short years ago. I feel a particular kinship to him. My advisor at the University of Chicago Divinity School, uh, Dr. Dwight Hopkins, was Dr. Cohn's very first PhD student in his career. So you might say that uh, Dr. Cohn is my spiritual and academic ancestor. As a young minister and a scholar at the time of Dr. King's assassination, Dr. Dr. Cohn was distraught, discouraged, and frustrated if this powerful man who preached nonviolence and love had been struck down by the very violence that he abhorred. Dr. Cohn asked himself the question, can I be Black and Christian? Does this formula of love not work where my life is concerned, where Black lives are concerned? And it was his reading of this text in Luke 4 in which Jesus stands up in his home synagogue to read from the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. And when Dr. Cohn saw that Jesus was accepting the call to be with the poor, to be with those who were oppressed and held captive, those who were blind, he realized that Jesus said he was called to be with those who are marginalized. And Black people were and still are clearly among the marginalized. This gave Dr. Cohn a whole new way to understand the ministry of Jesus. It was a message of liberation for all, not just a few. And it helped Dr. Cohn move past the racist and exclusive interpretations of the sacred text that had often been used to um, justify not only slavery, but racial injustice and oppression for people of color. It became a way for him to see past the chaos of the time and understand how God could still move and how God could still use him in a call in the midst of that chaos. In my mind's eye, I I picture Jesus returning home, maybe for a church homegoing uh, service, synagogue homegoing service. People know that he's been out and about. He's left his home in Nazareth. And while no one is really sure just exactly what he's up to, he seems to be doing well and making a name for himself. So when he rises and is given the privilege of reading from the prophets, I'm sure his mother is there in the congregation as I would be if my son were doing something like this and just being so proud. Look how well he's turned out. And they're all saying, oh, what a nice job you did reading that scripture. But then Jesus starts to talk beyond verse 19 of what these scriptures actually will mean. The messiness of the world in which they live, the messiness of what it will mean for him to be the one who fulfills this scripture, as he says, in their hearing. The presence of the poor has always been there, he says. There are, uh, even with previous prophets, there have been difficult moments and when really the whole community has not worked together to eradicate this notion of of poverty. And after a few exchanges, they're no longer pleased. They're annoyed and angry and ready to throw him off the cliff. He's not talking about the conquering hero Messiah that they are imagining. He's talking about someone who will be willing to get into the messiness of the work that God has called them to do. One who is willing to touch and address the pain of the society around him. Jesus grew only more unpopular or less popular during his ministry and lifetime 
the religious leaders of the day had him under surveillance, so to speak, and he was considered dangerous because he did not conform to their humanly derived traditions and power structures. But Jesus didn't reject his calling. He got away from that crowd on that day, but he kept preaching and talking and healing and moving among the people. Similarly, Dr. King has been reified, deified since his death, but he was not too popular even among the black community. People in the North said, we don't have those problems up here. No need for you to arise and come to Chicago. Ministers in the South were afraid that he would disrupt their carefully constructed equilibrium. He was a systematic theologian, held a PhD, and he would likely have been quite content to simply be a big steeple pastor, preaching wonderful sermons, writing books, until he was called to be a part and really to be the face of the Montgomery bus boycott, largely because no one knew him. And of course, as we know, the rest is history. In these times, I've heard of too many pastors, not only among disciples congregations, but across the U.S. in all Christian traditions, even Muslim and Jewish traditions who are being called and challenged by their congregations because they are engaged in some form of advocacy. Maybe it's a march at a state capitol, maybe they have been to DC, or maybe it's just being involved in the poor people's campaign. Someone actually wrote a letter, a congregation left our denomination saying the GMP is spending too much time with the poor people's campaign. Well, maybe you've marched recently to say that Black Lives Matter or you've preached sermons condemning the killing of Black people by police and vigilantes. Maybe you've echoed the call for disciples to really live into and act in such a way that we are being the church we say we are, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world, a pro-reconciling anti-racist church. Maybe the messiness of the world is something that you've preached on Sundays. Maybe you've written papers about it, and maybe it's something that you've addressed head on in your ministry. Maybe at one point they were saying, oh, wow, she's really a great preacher. Look at her. We're so glad that we have her. But now that you're calling them to act, now that you're calling them to put feet to their faith, it may feel like they want to throw you from a cliff. There are disciples, pastors facing just these circumstances. Well, the holy calling is not one of comfort or ease, and I hate to bring it to you, but if that's what you thought when you decided to enter ministry, uh, Jesus and other saints have taught us quite differently. But if we believe that God's love is limitless, then of course we're also called, as Jesus was called, to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, give sight to the blind. So how do we stand in this hard, uncomfortable place? That's when it becomes so important to know what you believe about God, to know what you believe about the call of Jesus, to know that God's love is limitless. And so therefore, no limits can be placed on that love. No limits can be placed on that inclusion. Jesus calls us in this hard moment to stand with him, to proclaim the good news to the poor, to set at liberty those who are captive, to give sight to the blind, to comfort those who mourn to be with those who are marginalized. Why? Because God said so. Why? Because God loves and we must love as God loves. We must love one another as Jesus loves. And because there can be no limits that we can place upon that love, we will continue to be called to stand in uncomfortable places, a holy calling, uncomfortable truth. But if we stand with Jesus, this is where we are called. And I pray that together we can find strength not only from God and the Holy Spirit, but from one another to live out those callings faithfully and with grace. Amen.